Hello and welcome to TechFunnel.com's interview series. My name is Danny White and today we have the opportunity to talk to Shally Stecker. Shally is the president of the Sourcing Institute, founder of the Sourcing Institute Foundation, a 501c3 private operating foundation, and one of the originators of the talent sourcing discipline. A return Peace Corps volunteer with 22 years of recruiting experience, Steckerl has served as corporate sourcing leader for many Fortune 500 brands, including Microsoft, Google, Coca-Cola, Cisco, and Motorola, helping them efficiently find unfindable talent. Steckerl is the author of the industry standard textbook, The Talent Sourcing and Recruitment Handbook, and The Sourcing Method. He has served as adjuncts faculty at Temple University's Fox School of Business, where he taught the first ever full credit academic capstone course on recruitment and also served at Brandman University. He's a regular speaker at HR leadership conferences around the world and has been featured on NPR and the Wall Street Journal. Welcome, Shally. Thanks for joining us today. Wow. I'm pretty impressed with that person you were describing. (laughs) That's that's such a great intro. Thank you. (laughs) Like, wow, that's me? Who wrote that? That was me. (laughs) Well, tell us, how did you first get into talent sourcing and what has kept you interested all of these years? Hmm, not the same thing, tell you that much. Uh, what? How did I first get into talent sourcing? Well, I, I think the easiest way to answer that is uh, I won a pool tournament. Oh, wow. That's what it, that's what it comes down to. I, I was I just returned from the Peace Corps. They give you some, um, you know, resettling allowance, and you mm-hmm. can use that to put a deposit in an apartment and get a car and buy clothes because you really don't have very much left. Everything's pretty tattered. <laughs> Yeah. So I had used my allowance and then bought a car and got, got a computer and some clothes and, and traveled around the country visiting all my buddies from school and from the Peace Corps and staying with them and applying for jobs. And uh, all the way full circle back to Atlanta, my second to last stop before I went uh, back to my mom's apartment and, you know, knocked on the door with my tail between my legs, like, can you take me back? <laughs> um, and I was in a pool tournament with my friend who was letting me stay at his place. And he, he was like, hey, let's go to some pool um, to, you know, your last weekend before you go home and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So we did. And we met this couple there that, well, that was a, a husband and wife team. So this was a team's tournament. And we proceeded to uh, just banter back and forth and uh, an English couple. And you know how the English mm-hmm. like to. Um, talk a lot of talk in, in their, you know, they're, they're, they're big sports fans and such. So they, um, they were bantering and we were bantering back and forth and we got to know each other. And I, when I asked them, what do you do? And they told me about this, this staffing agency that makes money by placing people in jobs. And here I am trying to find a job. So I'm like, wow, that sounds like a scam. I want in, right? <laughs> like I can't, I can't get a job and you make right. money getting people's jobs. Like, you know, can you get me a job? And they said, why don't you come by the office on Monday? And I did. And they offered me the job on the spot as a headhunter. Wow. But I did not know what I was getting into. This was a commission-only job. Mm-hmm. Um, literally, like, there's your desk. There's your phone. Good luck. And there was a draw. So you had to pay it back at the end of the month if you didn't make placements. So I really, really quickly realized that I was going to get whooped by basically everybody else that had been doing it for more than a day than mm-hmm. I had. So I started, you know, I was, it was sink or swim and I was sinking. Yeah. Out of desperation, I, I just started, you know, surfing the internet late at night when I was home on my 14K dial-up laptop. Mm-hmm. My old compact probably has less memory than, than your Casio digital watch does these days. Yep. Exaggerating, obviously. But I connected to people online and was asking questions like, does anybody know anything about this or that? And I was getting resumes and I was bringing them to the office on a floppy disk. It's called sneaker net mm-hmm. and printing them out of the office. Yes, we had no internet. So we had to print and cut the top and paste it on a template. And that's where cut and paste actually came from. <laughs> and I started breaking every single company record. The branch was 32nd out of 34. And I brought it single handedly to number two in the country, got all kinds of commendations from the, the president and the owner and things like that. But really what it comes down to is I was not able to compete the way everybody else was doing the job. So mm-hmm. I had to turn to, you know, something that I didn't know what it was at the time, but it's disruption. It's, you know, doing mm-hmm. things completely out of the box because I was lazy because I didn't want to do it the hard way. I didn't mm-hmm. want to, you know, come up through the ranks of, and take my 
take my uh, lumps like everyone else did. So my laziness led to ingenuity, which led to me connecting with people online. And that's how I essentially started, you know, pioneering what we now call sourcing. They would, they would, you know, make fun of me and stuff like that when I brought in resumes, but they mm-hmm. stopped laughing after we broke a few records. <laughs> I bet. Nobody else was doing this as, as full time back then. And it, yeah. about two years later, um, a few other companies started having, you know, a role for uh, someone that was like a researcher and so on. But the, the sourcing mm-hmm. job title didn't even exist back then. We're talking about 96, 1996. Wow. So many, many years later, um, you're still in sourcing. Um, what are some of the top challenges that sourcers and recruiters face now on a regular basis? Yeah. So you did ask me what keeps me in. And so the challenges and what keeps me in are somewhat mm-hmm. similar. Um, I'm certainly not in it because I'm lazy. That, that's, yeah. that I, I still source and I still come up with sourcing techniques because I'm lazy. So mm-hmm. I think there's a famous quote, I want to say from Bill Gates, I may be misquoting, where he said, if I really want something to be done if I want something, if I want a problem to be solved, I'll give it to someone who's lazy because they'll find the easiest way to do it. Something like that is probably yeah. a misquote. But um, that's really today, you know, th- there's a lot of information. Mm-hmm. So when I started, it was about retrieving information, which was a challenge. So finding the information and mm-hmm. finding accurate information was, was really difficult. So it was about that. Then it became easier to do. So the internet became an enabler that, that allowed us to do our jobs faster. Right. And now there's just too much information. So we have the opposite problem. There's so much junk, garbage, you know, spam, whatever you want to call it, that you know, using the internet as a, as a, as a tool to source candidates, um, the, the challenge now is basically filtering. It's mm-hmm. learning to um, eliminate the, the junk so you get only the results that you want or else you spend hours and hours chasing down, you know, every little rabbit hole until you find a sale on Amazon and end up shopping before right. you realize it. <laughs> so yeah. the challenge now is really the, the filtering and another part of it, a really big part of it is the engagement, getting people to actually respond, mm-hmm. talk to you and really have those conversations. So um, that's the, that's what, challenges sorcerers these days and what keeps me in is solving those problems. I'm still very much a problem solver, a puzzle, the puzzle solver. Definitely. So you talked about the, the latter challenge of getting people to respond, the engagement level. What are some of the techniques that you've come up with lately um, to get people to respond to those postings or to sorcerers and recruiters? Well, um, some of the techniques I'll tell you are uh, a, a bit of a hack, and mm-hmm. I don't discuss them publicly because they're a little bit of the, the secret sauce. Okay. But the hacks by themselves, they, they don't do the job. You've got to have these other pieces that I'm happy to discuss. So I'll give you, you, know, I'll give you 90% of the answer. That last little ingredient I'll keep to myself. And <laughs> you, you can call me privately, and I'll tell you okay. over the phone, but I don't want that out there. Um, some of the things that are common, I, number one, I would say, and the biggest mistake sourcers and recruiters make mm-hmm. is only reaching out once. You've got mm-hmm. to try multiple times. There's a lot going on with technology, especially with email. Email mm-hmm. is still very effective, much more effective than in-mail mm-hmm. in, in contacting candidates because you still get your email in your inbox. And in-mail on LinkedIn, a lot of people are turning it off. So they mm-hmm. have to go on LinkedIn to get it. They don't may not, may not necessarily check their LinkedIn account frequently enough. So even though they are getting it, I've received a re- I received a response. I got to tell you, I, I circulated this email within my company uh, mm-hmm. about two months ago because I thought it was so funny. It was just so funny. I got a reply from a candidate that I sent an email to. Six hundred. I'm kidding you. Not okay. Six hundred and sixty six days. Oh, wow. After. Yeah, wow. like the number itself was kind of weird. Yeah. But the fact that it was literally two years, mm-hmm. okay? So 666 days. He goes, sorry for the late response, but I'm inquiring <laughs> as to, you know, are there still some positions open in finance or whatever? Yeah. And I just, I copied, I did a screenshot and sent it to my, my entire team. And I said, hey, guys, do you think I should reply to them in 666 days or should I reply right now? <laughs> 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 two years later. 
So, you know, it's not that it doesn't work. It's just a long tail. So yeah. what happens is with the technology that companies are implementing in order to try to protect their employees from spam, mm-hmm. I'm noticing that first emails from anyone, doesn't matter that you're a recruiter, doesn't mean that you're a spammer or anything, but just first emails in general mm-hmm. are being quarantined very often. Okay. So if I send you one email and you've never gotten an email from me before, mm-hmm. the chances are pretty high that email is going to end up in your quarantine. When I send you a second message, your servers then go, oh, this is not a spammer because spammers don't send the same message twice. Right. So because that's not happened, because I've sent you a second message from my same account to your same account, mm-hmm. then they unquarantine and deliver both. Okay. That's what I'm noticing. And that's one technique. But besides that, simply emailing twice isn't enough. You want to send a second message after that, so basically a third message, the first one twice and then a second message. Um, You want to send out other types of communication. You want to send them a text message, try to reach them on Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. And before you go, oh, why would I send anybody a message on Facebook or Twitter or whatever? Here's the thing. If you feel like you need to get a reply from a candidate via email, Mm -hmm. then you're prejudiced. Right. That is your prejudice, your bias, Mm -hmm. because who are you to dictate how a candidate wants to respond? If you respond via email, great, you like email. But what if, you know, Sean likes to respond via Facebook? What if that's where he communicates? Mm -hmm. What if Alex likes Snapchat? What if Mary likes Twitter? Who Mm -hmm. are you to say, you may only talk to me through email because that's how I want to be communicated with? Right. you know, when I talk to recruiters and they go, oh, I'm never going to send out a message through Snapchat. That's too personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Recruiting is personal. Hello, business is personal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to try and get in touch with this candidate and they're Mm -hmm. on Snapchat all day, send them a message in Snapchat. That's where they are. Right. Why not go where they are? Why try to force them to come to you? That's not what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. So multiple messages and multiple touch points, multiple access points is, is the biggest takeaway. And then the second one is, Try to personalize. You know, personalization is key. Mm-hmm. If you don't mention their name and why you're contacting them, they're not. You're just one of another pile of junk mail, right? I mean, what what right. distinguishes junk mail? Yeah. It's the same message everyone gets. That's mm-hmm. what spam is. I don't know if you remember the the Monty Python scene where they coined the term <laughs> spam. Yes, that's where spam comes from. Not from yeah. the canned meat that that mm-hmm. they love in Hawaii. But from the spam, 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 spam. Mm -hmm. What is spam? It's repeating the same thing over and over and over. And that's what not personalization does. Right. When you personalize, you're letting this person know, hey, I took a minute. Look, I might have taken five seconds to look at your profile, but I Mm -hmm. took five seconds to look at your profile. And I know what your job title is and your company. And I'm writing to you because of your name and title and company and what you do. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it only took me five seconds, but that's better than... I just found a bunch of email addresses and I spammed everyone and sent them the exact same message, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, what a lot of recruiters end up doing, unfortunately. So personalization and touch points, those those two are, I think, the biggest keys. And besides that, there's some little hacks on deliverability and a few other, Mm -hmm. you know, secret tools of the trade. Um, I would say probably one of the tools of the trade I don't mind giving away is test your emails. Okay. Send them to a testing service. There's a lot of free ones out there, like Mail Tester and things like that, where they can actually give you a score of like how spammy it is. Mm-hmm. You know, are there any keywords in there that you might have omitted? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give you an example: opportunity. You know the word opportunity. Right. Well, job opportunity, right? Employment opportunity. We used to say like this is an employment opportunity. The word opportunity is a bad word. It's considered a curse word in mm-hmm. spam because of all the multi-level marketing. Right. You know? Yeah. So it's not a you know foul word, but it is considered a spam word. Spam word. So yeah. it might get you blocked, not by itself, but if you have opportunity and you know some other you know too many images or whatever mm-hmm. syntax. So just test your emails okay. and just see how you're doing. You know, I, I did that once and I had a forty percent. That's forty percent delivery rate, meaning wow. that out of a hundred messages, only forty actually got there. The other mm-hmm. sixty never even arrived. Imagine if the mail was like that. You're sending out your Christmas card and you send 100 Christmas cards out and only 40 of your relatives get them. Mm-hmm. The others just mm-hmm. are like, what? what? I didn't get a card. What's going yeah. on? <laughs> and you're like, but I sent you one. 
Yeah. They never got it. Well, I sent it. Look, I even have the receipt, no? So, yeah, crazy world. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned earlier about the over the massive amounts of information that recruiters get. Um, how do you think sourcers can build a, a really effective game plan to avoid getting overwhelmed by all the information that is available to them? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. How do we avoid getting overwhelmed? So I did a webinar on, on this very topic called information overload, or mm-hmm. um, the, the, the name of the webinar was mission control. Mm-hmm. I have put together a mission control document in Google. It's a Google Sheets document, basically, that helps organize. I think the bottom line here is have a plan. Okay, Have, a, have something like my mission control, which you can get for free. Mm-hmm. And that document helps you figure out where you've been where you haven't been, what worked, so you go back to the ones that you liked that worked and repeat those, or mm-hmm. avoid the ones that didn't work. Um, track your search strings, track your sources, and, and do checklists, so, right. you know, task lists. So I think that's a big part of it, mm-hmm. is just gathering the data so that you can learn from it and you can keep organized. I think another part of it is learning to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, triage, like in a like in a hospital, you know, mm-hmm. everything that comes at you, I mean, it could be emails, calls. Um, I know some people that are there that, that just live by the, the get things done GTD methodology right. and, and have like, you know, Oh, I'm a big subscriber to zero inbox or whatever. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. I get an average of 780 emails a day. Wow. So I can't, there's That's no impossible. way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'll never have zero inbox because I literally stop for one day. You know, I go to bed Sunday night, wake up Monday morning, and I've got 400 emails. Mm. So it's impossible to do that in some cases. But triage, right? So what, mm-hmm. is it that, what is it that only you can do that can't be delegated? What is it that is only for you, where you're the person that that message went to, where you're not copied or BCC'd, where it's necessary for you to take action? What do you have to do? Mm-hmm. And if you can do it in two minutes, do it right away. I know it seems counterintuitive, but if you can do it in two minutes, just get it done. Right. If you can't, then put it in a queue of stuff to do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whatever you can do right now that only you can do, do it. If someone else can do it, pass it on, delegate it, right? And if it's something that only you can do, but it's going to take you an hour, then you put it on your, you know, schedule it, put it on a planner or put it on your to-do list or something mm-hmm. like that and delete everything else. You know, the whole concept of I'm going to read this later, never, <laughs> never, happens. ever, ever happens. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. Sure. If it's important enough, it's going to come back. Mm-hmm. If it is important enough, it will circle back. If it's information, if it's news, you'll get it somewhere else. You didn't get right. it this time, you'll get it next time. If it's an email, someone will remind you. I mean, I'm not saying let's go around depending on other people to remind us, but mm-hmm. I am saying be aggressive about keep, delete, act, delegate right. and don't worry about missing stuff. Cause if it's important enough, you're not going to really miss it. Mm-hmm. Very good advice. Um, so a lot of recruitment is about building relationships in this day and age. So how do you encourage sourcing leaders to build those relationships and connections within the industry and stay ahead of the competition? You know, that's ironic that you say that uh, I hear a lot. I get a lot of guff about, automation and outsourcing is being automated and how we're going to automate sourcing. And then you get, and then you come over here and you ask me a question, like, how do we put the human back in? So how do those <laughs> two coexist, right? How are yeah. we, how are sourcing leaders talking about sourcing automation and then talking about human contact? Like that mm-hmm. doesn't, you know, it, it's like that ad on TV about the guy that's talking smack about robots and the robots are serve, serving them at a diner and, <laughs> and their friends are like, dude, you're so clueless. Like look at all these robots that are doing nice things for you and you're talking bad about them. So here's the thing. Automation exists and should exist and should continue to exist to help us do the things that are tedious, Mm -hmm. the things that do not require human contact, the things that are repetitive, monotonous, the things that can really be... So let's take the the word automation and where does that come from? It comes from autonomy, autonomous, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. To really, truly automate, something has to be autonomous. If it's not autonomous, it is not automation. Mm-hmm. Okay? So um, a self-driving car that still requires you to be behind the wheel and 
touch the wheel every five minutes, like Tesla, as cool as that is, it's not autonomous. Mm -hmm. It's still a robot that needs human guidance. So what I'm telling you here is when sourcing and automation meet, it's when and, and when they work well together, it's when sourcing can, can automate certain aspects that don't require human intervention, intervention mm-hmm. that don't require supervision. Things like, for example, enriching data, okay? So a really easy thing to automate is if you have a list of names, upload it to a service where they append the email and phone number right. or company name and title. Because as a human, I used to have to go and hunt and peck all over the internet to get that person's email. Right. Now I still do that, but I only do it 20% of the time because I've got services that I pay for that can do it 80% of the time. Mm-hmm. But notice they're not doing it 100% of the time, and I still have to verify. So in that case, automation is helping me. I can do a lot more sourcing today than I could before because I can grab a spreadsheet of names, upload it, and get 80% of the email addresses. Right. Great. I'm 80% of the way there. And then I can automate my emails. I still have to write them and personalize them, but mm-hmm. I can put them on a track where I can send you a message, and if you don't reply in five days, the system automatically sends you another one. Mm-hmm. That's okay to automate as long as there's a human watching that, and a human can intervene and stop it or correct it, et cetera. Right. Um, so it's never going to be really automated. It's, it's going to be assisted or augmented, right? Okay. So think of ways that you can eliminate tasks that are error-prone, Mm-hmm. Where, where human error is, is the most common error. Mm-hmm. Um, things like data entry. Here's another really good one. Parsing information. Do you remember back in the day? Well, I don't know if you do, but I definitely remember back in the day when we used to, we used to have to like type in the contact information because the resume was a piece of paper that you couldn't right. scan it. You know, the, yes, you know. So you had to like type the phone number in. Well, back then, I used to make a lot of errors in, in typing stuff in, and I would have a phone number that was incorrect. Mm-hmm. It was 6960, and I would type in 6069, and I'm trying to call on that person, and I'm like, man, they gave me the wrong number. But no, they didn't. No. didn't. I just <laughs> typed it in wrong. Yeah. But you know what robots can really do wrong? That. They can grab the phone number and put it in. So nowadays, ATSs have completely automated that because mm-hmm. the resume gets parsed by the ATS most of the time correctly. Now, here's the downside. Even the best ATS in the world still misses a few. Right. Because sometimes phone numbers don't have the dot or the hyphen, mm-hmm. or the phone number is in a GIF or a JPEG, and mm-hmm. it's not text readable. Yeah. So even in the best of times, you still need to have somebody watching over the machines. So <laughs> machines and humans working together <laughs> is what you're proposing. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's augmenting what we do with machines and then not losing track of the fact that we're really automating the tedious processes so that we can get to talk to the person. We don't want to automate talking to the human. Mm-hmm. We want to automate all of the junk that leads us to talking to a human. Absolutely. So making it easier so that I can spend more time talking to you mm-hmm. and less time programming stuff and doing things with data entry. That's where automation comes in because I ultimately want to talk to you. I also have to spend a lot of time figuring out who you are before I talk to you. So a big part of what gets overlooked in sourcing is the creative components of where are these people? How do I right. get to them? It's not always go to Google or go to LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we got to figure out other ways. And so that aspect of the strategy, the, the intake meeting, understanding what the hiring manager wants and translating what they want to what people talk about, which may be the same thing, but they have different words to use. So that part of it is where the human cognition, where our ability to think laterally comes mm-hmm. in. And that's not something that we're going to be automating anytime soon. Sure, we can automate a lot of the other tedious aspects of what we do, but not the part where we talk to a hiring manager and translate, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. What you really want is someone that has five years of experience because you're looking for someone that's mature in the job, Mm -hmm. but they don't have to have five years in Java. If they have five years as a programmer, it's okay if they learn another language, Mm -hmm. but the computer would interpret that as five years Java, and if it's four years, eliminate candidate. Right. See what I mean? Yeah. So we want to get to the point where we actually have that conversation with the hiring manager and with the candidate, that's what sourcing automation is helping us do. Not eliminating the job of the sourcer, but eliminating the boredom and repetitive, time-consuming, lower-value tasks mm-hmm. that still get us to the job. We still make you know, placements, but we don't really need to, you know, why pay me $150 an hour to do data entry? Right. Absolutely. When a machine can do that. 
but I'm definitely worth $150 an hour when I'm talking to a hiring manager and I'm asking <laughs> the right question. Right? Very true. So. Very true. What is uh, one thing that has been consistent for you in talent sourcing that you thought might have changed by now? Hmm. One thing that has been consistent for me in talent sourcing that I thought would have changed by now. Hmm. That's a really good question. I would have expected machines to be able to predict more by now, mm, okay. but they never really quite got there. So a lot of the promise of what they call artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and um, machine learning and all that, we're really far away from what that really looks like. It, it's a lot of, you know, smoke and mirrors. Sadly, the promise of artificial intelligence was made in the 60s, mm -hmm. and it really hasn't changed very much. What we see out there now as artificial intelligence is really the same kind of decision tree. If this, then that. If right. this other thing, then the other thing. It's not a machine thinking. It's a machine mm -hmm. following a set of rules, Sequences, which yeah. is the exact same thing you could do with a Turing machine with paper and you know, holes stamped in it. Mm -hmm. Not that different. By now, I would have thought that we would have machines. I would have thought that Siri and Alexa and... Um, I'm probably missing one, and Hey Google mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. would actually be able to answer questions because they're thinking about it instead of mm -hmm. through you know, processing language patterns. Um, so that's what I'm disappointed in. I'm disappointed in, in, in that we haven't made the progress that was promised to us mm -hmm. with regard to artificial intelligence. And instead, we're getting sold a bunch of stuff that's pseudo, that pretends to be, that looks like, you know, hey, tell me what it really is. Tell me this is really just deep learning, mm -hmm. you know. Tell me that that's what it is, and then I'll buy it because I get it, and I know what the usefulness of the tool is. Right. But yeah. don't sell it to me as artificial intelligence when it really isn't. Tell it to me as, hey, we got this robot that we programmed for 99% of the things you might encounter. Occasionally, 1% of the time, they're wrong. Okay, fine. I'll pay for that because I don't mind spending money to do things, you know, that I don't like to do to have the machine right. do them. But when when you've got vendors that are out there talking about how it's, oh, artificial intelligence, buzzword, buzzword, mm -hmm. and it really isn't, that actually hurts us. Gotcha. It hurts us in the long term. So that's uh, what I would say would be the one thing I wish should have changed. Awesome. Shally, thank you so much for sharing your insights um, with us. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, where can people find out more about you? Well, um, tsi-corp.com. Okay. And uh, on Twitter, Shally, S-H-A-L-L-Y. And on LinkedIn, forward slash Shally as well. Okay. So you can reach me there. But if you go to tsi-corp.com, that, that'll have you know, my contact information there as well. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. We really do appreciate it. Um, guys, thanks for listening to this interview. For these and other interviews and topics, you can visit us at techfunnel.com and connect with us across social media and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.